the title is God Saw and It Repented the Lord. Uh, and of course, uh, those are metaphorical because God is a spirit. I mean, you know, God doesn't have eyeballs to see. Uh, he doesn't uh, uh, depend on emotions to make decisions. He has foresight. Uh, but yet, uh, I, this is a very important study because it shows us, teaches us, the Holy Spirit teaches us what the Lord means when he is speaking. It's a type of a metaphor. Yet the whole, like, you know, flood itself is a prophetical metaphor. And we'll cover some more of that next week when we actually get into the flood um, specifically. Basically going to get into chapter six of Genesis today. Uh, so the title again is God Saw and It Repented the Lord. Now, why would the Lord have to, quote, repent? And many times in the book of Genesis, especially chapter one, it tells us that God saw. This is basically what we're up against. Let's take a look at Genesis Chapter 6, verse 5 and verse 6, and this will set the foundation. Verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, you know, it took me a long time when I first read this, and I remember reading it as, uh, you know, when I was very young, uh, before I was 10 years old. And, and uh, uh, how could, you know, in my mind at that time, how could every imagination of the thoughts of all the people's heart was only evil continually? Uh, of course, at that time, my, you know, conception of evil was, uh, you know, Frankenstein or something like that. But, but uh, I, even when I got older, you know, this is something that uh, was uh, hard to get a hold of. That that the whole world, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and yet that is what the the earth was all about at this time in chapter 6 of Genesis, just before the flood. Now, last week we saw some of the prophecies. Remember Lamech, Noah's father, had prophesied that from that time, 120 years later, would be the flood. And then Lamech also prophesied that his son, Noah, would be the comforter. He would comfort, uh, you know, the people. Uh, from the toils and, and snares uh, that, that was prevalent in the earth because God had, had cursed the earth. Remember, God didn't curse Adam and Eve. He cursed the earth. And uh, uh, Eve was to, because of the sin, uh, suffer pain in childbirth. And that, that uh, uh, Adam was to have to work every day by the sweat of his brow in order to eat. And Lamech prophesied that Noah was going to make it easier. And I'm sure that the flood did. The flood just changed everything. So verse 5 tells us God saw, God looked down, he saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Uh, now, if we thought verse 5 was a little difficult to interpret, but, but 
the people's um, imagination and thoughts could only be evil continually all the time. Verse 6 says, the Lord repented that he had made man on earth. Ouch. Uh, now, we're going to take a look at the, you know, parts of the first chapter again. And God took a look at his creation, each day of creation, and, and saw that it was good. But in chapter 6, he did not look at it and say that it was good at all. He said that every imagination of the thoughts of men's heart was only evil continually. And it says that grieved the Lord. It grieved him at his heart. So that's what we're going to deal with today. That's what chapter six is about. Of course, uh, it's it's not any problem that's too hard for the Lord to to take care of. Of course not. Nothing is. And the Lord has foresight. He knew it was going to happen. And you might remember that ever since chapter one, we've been emphasizing and looking at scripture to show how God uh, created everything in anticipation of uh, what he had to do in the future. Of course, God is the only one that can do that because he has foresight. Man does not have foresight. So this is the foundation of today's lesson. Would you pray with me now that the Lord uh, take over, watch everything that I say, that only uh, God's teaching, God's words, what God meant will come out of my mouth and the Holy Spirit will teach us what God wants us to know here in uh, the sixth chapter of Genesis. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, I thank you, Lord, the way that you set up your word, Lord, that you show us from the very beginning that you created uh, in anticipation of what was going to happen. Lord, I thank you that you're not the kind of God that makes knee-jerk reactions like men do. Lord, mm -hmm. I, I thank you that you know what's going to happen in the future. And I thank you, Lord, that you took care of it before you even started creating the world. In the last book of the Bible, Revelation 13, verse 8, you tell us that Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Lord, you had this plan before you even started creating. And you sent your son down because you loved the world. Lord, I, I, I just want to express that I love you today because you love me. I learned to love you because you gave me the word. And I know that, that people that are listening today uh, or even that listen to the uh, recording after uh, will do the same or they wouldn't. Uh, even participate in studying your word. Lord, I pray that you'll take over this study. Lord, I pray that uh, you'll send the Holy Spirit, be the comforter to each heart that hears your word as you promised that you would do. We know that you're faithful. And Lord, teach us, open our eyes, open our ears, Lord, so that uh, uh, we will desire to put you above any pull of this world. Lord, you, you told us in uh, the first John chapter three, that when we see you, referring to the rapture, when we meet you in the clouds, that we will see you as you are, because we'll be like you. Yes, Lord. Can't wait till that day, Lord. Teach us, Lord, today to walk before you as Enoch did and was translated, as Noah did 
and Noah did everything that you commanded him to do. Teach us that walk today, Lord, that our desires, our, our imaginations will not be evil, but they will be righteous imaginations as we follow your word, walking in the spirit. Teach us today, Lord, I pray, looking for your appearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I, uh, those of you that uh, have uh, studied with us know that uh, uh, my idea of interpreting scripture, and I think this is one of our greatest duties that the Lord has given us. He told us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, and that that study is profitable uh, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that we can be fully equipped to do what the Lord wants us to do. And in order to do that, we need to have what I like to call the Pike's Peak view of Scripture. If you've ever gone to the top of Pike's Peak, you can see all over. Then you, you can see Arizona, and you can see New Mexico. You can see the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. It seems like you can see forever when you get on top of that. We need to view the Bible like that. And of course, the, the Lord wrote his book exactly like that. But besides the Pike's Peak view of scripture, we also need to realize that God does everything to manifest his glory. That God is glorified. You might remember uh, John uh, 15, when the Lord said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Uh, that, that we can't do anything unless we abide in the vine. Um, uh, and we, he also tells us that, that the Father sent us, or Jesus sent us, as the Father sent Jesus, which is to give the word uh, out. And John 15 in the vine and the branches parable teaches us that when we do that, then God the Father is glorified. So that tells us that, that uh, in our interpretation, when we take a look at the Pike's Peak view of scripture and try to do that every lesson that we have, every study, that if we're not seeing the manifestation of the glory of God, we have the wrong interpretation. Let's just take a look at uh, some examples of what I'm trying to say, and we'll get right into Genesis here quickly. But uh, I'd like to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Now we're going to uh, go to a few passages in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 as well. But this book was, was uh, the Apostle Paul, the human author that the Lord used to pen the, the um, letter to the church at Ephesus, uh, an important church that Paul founded. Uh, and Paul is going to talk about in the book of Ephesians uh, about mysteries. He's going to talk about the mystery of God even. Uh, and he's, he's going to tell us that God lifts us up into heavenly places when we are in him. Uh, but the Lord is also going to stress that his people need to humble themselves. That, that when we come before the Lord, we need to come with humility because God's going to resist the proud but he will deal with the humble. Teaching all the way through the Bible, but the book of Ephesians deals with it. Um, throughout our lifetime, 
And I think it's a very important book. And it's a book that is misinterpreted. And that's what uh, I'd like to really deal with right now. Um, because you notice what, what God is saying here, uh, that, that uh, he says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, this isn't just something that happened, but this Gentile church, these were Greeks mostly, in this church that the Apostle Paul founded. Uh, it, it, it's not just a coincidence that they, you know, started walking with God. And he's going to talk about that in the, in the next verse. But it is a plan that God started. Remember Moses in the book of Deuteronomy prophesied that the nation of Israel, that, that the Lord built a people uh, and then built uh, those people into a nation. He said that that nation is going to make him jealous by uh, chasing after other gods. And so he, the Lord is going to make them jealous, the Israelites jealous with a people that weren't a people. We're going to see in, in the book of First Peter and in Revelation, I mean, in Romans 11, that the Lord is going to talk about those people as, as uh, they weren't a people, they were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, but yet the Lord uh, uh, called them in order to make the Jew, the Israelite, jealous. And what's the purpose for all of that? Because the Lord, during the tribulation period, right at the end, when Jesus comes back the second time, he's going to bring mm -hmm. Israel mm -hmm. back to himself. And in eternity, there's not going to be any Jew or Greek or male or female or anything. It's all going to be one with God. Yeah, the Lord sure. called out a people in order to, the, the Jews were to be a light for the Gentiles. When they weren't a light anymore, the Lord took the, the baton from uh, Israel and handed it to a people that were not a people. Today, the Gentiles are to give out the word of God. Uh, mostly Gentile church. There's Jews in it as well. Uh, but there's going to be a time, and it's when Jesus comes the second time, that he's going to take that baton from the, the church, and he's going to, you know, uh, be king of the universe himself. We're going from Genesis all the way through Revelation there. Verse 2 of the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. Most of the Gentiles did. According to the prince and the power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Do, you, do we see here what, what walking uh, in the flesh, as the Apostle Paul is going to call it, uh, mm -hmm. in the eighth chapter of Romans, is uh, directed by the Satan. prince and power of the air, Satan. So before this, this Gentile church walked according to the course of this world, directed by Satan. Verse 3, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Amen. By grace are you saved. Can we see that the, the God uh, planned taking away our sins before he ever started creating the world? This is the God that, that we serve. He's, he's not, he doesn't do any knee-jerk reactions. 
and hath raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ. Now, this is not physically. One day it will be. At the rapture, we're going to be transformed, I, you know, and be like Jesus. But today we are not. But the Lord still lifts us up spiritually in the heavenly places when we walk with him. Amen. And this is what the Lord wants, and he's teaching us that here in the book of, Eph uh, of Ephesians, that in the ages to come, now this is the reason for it. You notice it starts that. So in verse 6, he's saying that God has raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, figuratively now. But at the rapture, we're going to be there. What's the reason for this? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, we have to realize what God has been saying all the way through the Bible. That Moses prophesied that his people made him jealous. And so he was going to make them jealous. Why? So that in the ages to come, he's going to point out to the entire world, look at these people that weren't a people ever. They were, they were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. They had no hope. But he's going to point out and say, look what my grace did. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. This is a plan that God has, and he's carrying it out now. And he has been, and he's going to continue. That's what it's all about. Now, this next verse that has been twisted and contorted all over the world for quite a while now. Both the Jews had the wrong idea about this thought that, that God is bringing out here, and so has the church. But he's saying the reason that in the ages to come, he's going to show the riches and, and grace in his kindness towards the Gentile, right, through Christ Jesus, because or for by grace are you saved through faith. It's through God's grace. Now, sometimes we have a, a uh, the wrong conception of how God delivers his grace. And we're going to see that today in chapter 6 of Genesis because the first mention of grace, God's grace, is in chapter 6 of Genesis. For by grace are you saved through faith. I... Uh, and, you know, faith is opposite from being bound by the law. What is faith now? Remember what it is? It's knowing that God's going to do what he said he would do, right? Amen. Uh, and so we know that God said, I'm going to save you if you walk with me. And we know he's going to do that because he's faithful and promised. And what does he tell us to do in Hebrews chapter 10? Stand fast in the profession of our faith. I mean, hang on, continue until the end. Huh? Why? Because he is faithful that promised. And uh, it's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Now, nobody, I, I don't think, would... Uh, you know, have any problem with that verse. But the next one uh, that is actually, do we notice that this isn't the end of that sentence where it says it is the gift of God? This continues on, even though there is a verse, you know, change uh, as far as the numbering system. But, but that isn't a period at the end of God there. It's a colon. So this is one sentence, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now we can hear today that because of this, that we, we can't work 
that if we work, we're trying to buy our own salvation. And that is not what God is talking about here. Now, the book of Ephesians has the, the context of boasting. But Paul is also going to talk about that in 2 Corinthians. And we're going to go there here in a little bit. What's the reason that it's not of works, lest any man should boast? We don't want to forget this verse because we're going to see what God means by it. For or because, you notice that all of these are, are connected. Now, this is a new sentence, but it begins with for, so it's tied in with, with the rest of it. We are his workmanship. Yeah. <laughs> He is working in us. We are created in Christ Jesus unto. Do we see that? Yep. He created us unto good works. That's the only reason that we could work. This is not saying that salvation is not a work so we don't have to work. It's not saying that at all. It's saying that we shouldn't boast or we shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, be proud okay. of the fact because we are his workmanship that we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Good works. Now, when did God ordain that? Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God was ordaining that when, when, when Enoch walked with God and God took him. God was, was ordaining that when uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God was ordaining that in the 17th chapter of Genesis when after God had made a covenant with, with Abraham and his seed, so God said, God said to Abraham, Abraham, when you're 99 years old, today I want you to walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant with you. You know, God had ordained from the very beginning that we should walk in what? Good works. Good works. Yes. That's what God wants us to do. If, if we don't walk in good works, then we don't have salvation. Can we see how twisted and contorted that this is? Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That... At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. What did the blood of Christ do? It paid the price. Yeah. That's redemption, huh? When, when we go buy something at the store, we're redeeming that product. It's like uh, somebody buying a slave. He's redeeming that slave. And that's what Christ did. He paid for our salvation with his own blood. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. As it says in the book of of uh, timothy that there's one mediator between god and man that's the man christ jesus that jesus is the partition the middle wall of the partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments ordained in the ordinances for to make it himself of twain of two one new man so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. Now, it's true that Jesus paid the price. But just like 
God made the covenant with Abraham, and then years later, he says, now, Abraham, I want you to walk before me and be perfect, and I will make my covenant with you. It's the same thing up here when we when we see uh, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, uh, and 10, that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. When we walk in good works, then we partake of, of um, you know, the Lord's re redeeming power, and we are uh, delivered. You know, there's there's redemption. We need to walk with God in order to be delivered. And at the rapture, we'll be delivered out of this world. That's when it's going to be, you know, be completely fulfilled. But today, we can walk as though we're in heavenly places. That's what the, the book of Ephesians is telling us. If we take a look at the Pikes Peak, you know, uh, view of Scripture. Now, let me go to 2 Corinthians Um. Yeah, let's take a look at this. Paul is going to talk here about when he came to the church at Corinth. Now, Corinth is probably the biggest church that that uh, the Apostle Paul founded. And, of course, it was uh, uh, a big part of the old Grecian Empire. Uh, and uh, the Greeks were... were uh, a proud people and they they uh, uh were earnest christians when when they were founded but remember the, the book of corinthians paul had to write to him and say i've got one thing against you um because you say i am a paul i am a paulus and that sort of thing they were dividing themselves here in 2 Corinthians, Paul is going back to the time where he had actually uh, come to them with the gospel. And it says in verse 10, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his body presence is weak and his speech contemptible. In other words, some people are talking that about Paul. Let such an one, he says, think this, that such as we are, now, that's talking about Paul and his ministers with him. In word, by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. Hmm. It says, when I'm absent, you know, I send you letters. But when I am present with you, you're going to see by my works. Amen. Now, you know, Romans 3 and 4 tells us that we're justified by, by faith. And James chapter 2 says that that faith is vindicated when the works are present. This is what Paul's teaching here again, using himself as an example. For we dare not make ourselves of number or compare ourselves with some that command themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. They don't come to you boasting, come to you with humility because and the power of the Holy Ghost. We can't have the power of the Holy Ghost if we're proud. The power of the Holy Ghost comes when we're humble. But we will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed unto us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Now, what is Paul doing? You see that here, Second Corinthians is talking about um, people being proud or humble. Paul says, we, when we come to you with the gospel, are humble. But that doesn't mean that we stop working. He says, we did work. Can we see this is the same context as in the book of Ephesians? 
And it's not to stop working. It's that we cannot do the works of God if we are boastful. And that's what God was talking about in the book of Ephesians. As though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching of the gospel of Christ. That is the best work anybody could do. Not boasting of things without our measure. Of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. Why? Because God promised that. And they know he's faithful that promised. In other words, Paul was, was content. He says, I'm not going to take anything from you. I am going to walk before you and you're going to see the good works that God is doing through me. And I won't lack anything. That is ultimate faith, isn't it? And why? To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready in our hand. You see, Paul was not worried about just this congregation in Corinth, but every place that he went. And he was mindful that he needed to be humble and he needed to do the work that God sent him to do and not worry about himself <laughs> or his, his uh, financial condition or his health condition or anything else, except do what God wants him to do, those good works. Huh? Be humble because he knew that if he humbles himself in due time, God will exalt him. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I, yeah. I, 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 That's a great verse right there, Ryan. Yeah, I, yeah. we can see that both uh, Ephesians and 2 Corinthians are in the same context. They're both about works and they're both about pride and humility. And they complement each other. They interpret each other. One is a commentary of the other. And that's the way we see the Pikes view, uh, Peak's view of Scripture, just exactly that way. And it's, it's what God called uh, the way the Holy Ghost teaches us. How does he teach us? First Corinthians chapter 2, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth how comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You don't take two verses and beat them to death, as we see in very many churches today. We take the Pikes Peak view of Scripture and we give it that way. Um, I, I think that we've we've seen, um, you know, the foundation of what we're talking about here. I'm, I'm going to endeavor to take these principles as we go over Genesis chapter six here. I don't want to take time away from chapter six because this is where we are. At chapter six, the first two verses are probably twisted and contorted more than any other verse in the Bible. Maybe Ephesians 2, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are, are, are the bigger than Genesis 6. I don't know. But these two, very rarely will you see a godly interpretation of this. Now, what needs to happen when we have the correct interpretation? Remember what we said up here? The goal of the true exegete is to see the Pikes Peak view of Scripture. And if this view does not support the manifestation of the glory of God in every age, yes. the proper interpretation has not been achieved. Amen. It has to be for God's glory. Uh, that's what Paul said. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You know, the, the glory doesn't come to us. 
the glory comes to Christ. We humble ourselves, and in due time, God will exalt us. That is what the Bible teaches. Let's take a look at Genesis 6, 1 and 6, 2. And the biggest reason, I think, that, that uh, this is misinterpreted uh, is because... Uh, They'll take especially uh, verse 3 and verse 4 and separate them. Only interpret one verse and not put it in context. And this can, can happen. I, I know when I was younger, I did the same thing. Uh, and the Lord severely dealt with me uh, on that. I thought that I was right, but the Lord showed me that I was not keeping it in context. I know this is a very important part. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. You notice the comma? Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, we're going to go to verse 2, but the sentence hasn't ended. Verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, I want to, to bring across something that uh, we need to see, first of all, before we talk about it. There's no doubt the interpretation of the sons of God here in Genesis and the book of Job. Now, those two books are written about the same time. Uh, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Uh, Moses wrote, uh, when he wrote the book of Genesis, Moses wasn't alive when any of those things happened. God gave him you know, the book of Genesis on Mount Sinai. And I'm sure that it was handed down from Adam uh, and uh, uh, Enoch and Abraham. I'm, I'm sure that God's word was handed down, um, some of it. But I know that God also filled in the, the blanks because Moses could not possibly have written it. But the sons of God, I think it's six times that it is given in the book of Genesis and the book of Job. Each time, the sons of God means angels, either angels of God or fallen angels. Now, in that part, most people aren't wrong. And they there were angels that were sinning angels and we we read that in the book of jude and there was also we saw it already when we we read uh, verses five and six that there were men that sinned as a matter of fact almost all of the world all but eight people it says that their thoughts were only evil continually you notice what happened here, verse 3, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. You notice the Lord didn't say, I, I, I'm not always going to strive with those fallen angels. <laughs> he's, he's not going to strive at all with those angels. He's going to chain them up. The book of Jude tells us that. And then he's going to let them go in the tribulation period. And then their fate is going to be right along with with satan eventually they're going to be in the lake of fire but it's man that the lord said my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh yet his days shall be in 120 years remember we we talked about this last week this was lamech god speaking through lamech saying from that period to the flood is going to be 120 years. 
There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. <clears throat> and then it says, and God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay, so we have angels that that sinned. Uh, for instance, we know they're angels. Let me just give you one out of the book of Job. I won't go there, but it says that the sons of God, uh, you know, were rejoicing uh, during creation. In fact, this is one of the reasons that I think the angels were were created about day three. You might remember in the first chapter, we, we said that. It probably uh, day three or day four, uh, before man was there anyway, uh, there wasn't any man to rejoice, but the angels were rejoicing at creation. And remember, God looked down and he saw that it was good. It's I've got the verses right here. You can take a look at them. In Job, in the book of Genesis, sons of God meant angels. And these angels uh, looked down and saw the daughters of men that they were fair. Now, what did those angels do? That is the question here, and most people get it wrong. And I'll show you why. We've got a pronoun over here that I marked in green they what does uh that pronoun they what's the antecedent to they is it the sons of god mm -mm. no it's not it the the pronoun has to agree with the uh subject of the of the sentence and if we take just verse two we will think the subject is the sons of God, but it's not. This sentence has not ended yet. In other words, verse one is the first part of the, of the full sentence that is verse one and verse two. What is the subject of the first verse? And it came to pass when the men man. began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. You notice here is a pronoun that is, you know, their antecedent is men. Yep. All right. Now it's going to continue with a that. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. So this is telling us what the sons of God saw. And they refers back to the subject. Man. They took them wives of all which they chose. The sons of God doesn't take wives. Men do. But men do. And the subject of this entire sentence is man. And we had the first pronoun them and the second pronoun, they, that refers to man. Now, you know, when, when we come out with the, we've taken a look here at the Pikes Peak view as far as, as we could, you know, from, from the beginning. We'll continue this in a little bit. Uh, but I just gave you an interpretation, a grammatical interpretation. Now, when we make a grammatical interpretation this way we need to find some place in the bible that will tell us you know that we have the proper interpretation amen i might say from the beginning here that this story this genesis chapter 6 the things that happen here in chapter six, even though they seem like they're they're 
evil, they're they're um, uh, at continually. They're, it's full of sin. But God gets the glory for what happened here. Because it's not that the world was wiped out. It's that God saved eight people. And it's not just because God saved Noah and his wife and Noah's three sons and their, and their wives. Uh, you, you know, it's not just that everybody else died. It's that God saved the righteous people. Both before the flood... He saved uh, Enoch, which was a type of the church that's going to be saved before the tribulation period. And Noah and his wife and his sons and his son's wives were all saved, a remnant of the people. And God's remnant of the Jews are going to be saved at the end of the tribulation period. This is what God is preaching. God gets the glory. So we can we can see that part of it. Let's go back to a second Corinthians here and uh and go to chapter four. Let's see here. Uh, well, I, I can't find that right away. Let me go to another place that shows it. Maybe even better than that. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. You might remember that the Apostle Paul here in, in uh, to the church of Thessalonica, and he was writing this because the church of Thessalonica believed what Paul had taught them about the rapture, the second coming of Christ. But this church had seen some of their loved ones die. And so they write back to the apostle or send messengers over, you know, Timothy or somebody sent back to, to Paul and, and say, uh, we have some questions on this. There are loved ones that have died. Now, does that mean they missed the rapture? And so Paul explains that in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians 2, the Lord is going to tell us when the rapture happens. And he begins the first verse. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together unto him. You see, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is Christ's second coming. Not just because it sounds like it. We'll see it here in the context. So talking about the second coming and by our gathering together unto him, when's that going to happen? Rapture. The rapture. That's right. So this is the subject of the second chapter of Second Thessalonians is the rapture and the second coming. Paul puts it in the, in the opposite order. I think there's a reason for that. Now, what he does here in, is is kind of explained in verse two, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is the rapture. I think we'll see that in the uh, context here. The day of Christ is the same thing as by our gathering together unto him. Amen. Verse 3 says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. There is going to be the rapture first. And then there is going to be uh, the man of sin or the Antichrist revealed. And 
who opposeth and exalt himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. When is the Antichrist going to do this? We saw this in the book of Daniel. Abomination of desolation, three and a half years. That's right. The middle of the tribulation period, three and a half years into it. The first three and a half years is, is going to be the, the relative peace. The, the, the nation of Israel is going to think that this Antichrist is their Messiah that has come. And, and uh, they have the perfect peace. They're going to let their guard down. The Lord calls it in the book of Ezekiel as unwalled cities. Uh, and in the middle of the tribulation period, that peace pact is going to be broken by the, the um, uh, king of the north. And the Antichrist is going to have to come back up to Jerusalem. He's in Egypt at the time. He's going to have to come up to Jerusalem and kill the king of the north. And at that time, he's going to pronounce himself as God in the temple and things are going to get really bad in the tribulation period the last three and a half years so here we've got the rapture happening first and then we've got the tribulation period now let's finish this out remember ye not that when i was with uh, yet with you i told you these things and paul has already taught this to the church at thessalonica and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed at his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now we saw that in the book of Daniel too, that it was the angel Gabriel that was holding back the kings of the uh, times of the Gentiles. And when the father says it's okay, they let one out. That's the way uh, Nebuchadnezzar, came out this way the Persians came out this way Alexander the Great and so forth verse 9 even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders that of course is the the um, false prophet and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved there's all kinds of people not going to make it through the tribulation period there's all kinds of people that's going to make it too it's going to be really rough, though. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chose you to salvation mm -hmm. through sanctification of the spirit and the belief of truth. When did God do that? Because God hath from the, the beginning. beginning. That's not the beginning when they were saved, quote, unquote. That's the beginning, the foundation of the world. Yep. Now, God chooses the people that walk with him. The Bible also teaches that. Verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of glory. You see, the obtaining of glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. God is glorified in this. The worst time in the whole world's history, God is going to be glorified. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. You notice the, the admonition? Every time that, that especially in the letters of, of Paul, when mm. he talks about the second coming or the rapture, it is how we should walk with God. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. That's the Old Testament and Amen. the New Testament. New Testament. Verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope. You know, before we were a people without hope. But now we have hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work. Now, I want to come back to that's the, the whole story of chapter two in there. But I want to show you two verses. Come back to it. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, 14. All right, let's, let's start at verse 8 again. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming's after the working of Satan. Do you see, this is the same thing as Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. If we say, even him, this, this uh, uh, pronoun is referring to Christ, that means Christ is the one who's coming after the working of Satan. Do we see that? What is the subject up here, verse 8? And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. The subject is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to be consumed with the spirit of the Lord's mouth yeah. at the brightness of his coming. Amen. This is the second coming of Christ. Do you see that what Paul's teaching here? We've got, first of all, the, the uh, rapture. Then we have the tribulation period. And at the end of the tribulation period, Christ is going to come the second time and he's going to destroy the Antichrist. Yes. The brightness of his coming. That's his second coming. So the Antichrist is sandwiched in between the rapture and the second coming. But do you see that it says even him, a pronoun? And this him refers to the subject of the sentence. And then shall that wicked be revealed. That's talking about the Antichrist. That's not talking about Christ. The Antichrist is the one whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Can we see it is the same exact use of pronoun and antecedent that is used in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, let me go back to Genesis chapter 6. Let's see it in the context. Now let's take a look at that again. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Then daughters were born unto them, that sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. The subject here are the men. And the men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and they had daughters. This part right here, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, is what the angels did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it continues on with the same subject that they, the men, took them wives of all which they chose. Now, what were the angels doing here when they looked down at the daughters of men that they were fair? Probably less. You see, what the, the, what the fallen angels were doing was they saw the daughters of men, they were fair. They said, this is the way we can get those men. There's nothing wrong with taking wives, all of which they chose. But you notice what it's going to say in verse 5, that everybody's thoughts were only evil continuously. That didn't come about by just the men themselves. That came by them being possessed by Satan, that the whole world was, was uh, only thinking evil continuously. Now, again, I've, I've given you an interpretation here, a grammatical interpretation. We already saw one part of it, the grammatical part of it, uh, with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But where are we going to find what angels, fallen angels do with mankind. Well, we can see that in the Gospels. Let me go to Mark chapter 5. 
<clears throat> now, Jesus is, is going to teach here, and he has been teaching up at the, the uh, Sea of Galilee, or, or, or called Gennesaret. Uh, and he's going to go from the north up by Caesarea, and he's going to go down to the land of Gad. And you might remember the land of Gad is on the opposite side of the River Jordan, and where half of the tribe of Gad never did cross the Jordan. They were, uh, they didn't obey God. And so it, it, this was people that had forsook God. All of Gad didn't forsake God at that time, but half of the tribe did. Well, Jesus is going to that part. And you might remember in Isaiah chapter nine, Isaiah prophesied that those people up at the north were gonna see a great light. And Jesus did bring his light, his teaching to that area. As a matter of fact, that was the center of his, of his ministry for three and a half years. Verse two, and when he was come out of the ship immediately, there met him in tombs a man with an unclean spirit. This guy had fallen angels, and this guy had those demons inside him, who had this dwelling among tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had often bound with feathers and chains, and chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now, why would Satan want to worship him? And this is what we need to understand. Because those angels, those fallen angels, aren't content unless they are inhabiting somebody or something. Uh, you know, sin brings misery. And that's what they are. They see Jesus and say, oh, no, we're going to be cast out. They cried with a loud voice, these demons did, through this man. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Let's see, they didn't want to be sent away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and a herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it to the city and in the country and they went out to see what it was that was done see the people saw the light of god god gets the glory but this man was was pestered by uh demons why because they desired to inhabit people this guy had uh you know had sin against God, and that allowed the the demons in, and then he couldn't get rid of it. But Jesus got rid of them. But the reason for this story we can see is we can see what the sons of God in, in Genesis wanted to do. They wanted somebody to inhabit, and that's what they did. They looked down, and they saw the daughters of men were fair. And so this is what we can do. These, these are sinners. God's given us the okay to, to uh, inhabit these men. And we read just a couple of verses down that their thoughts were only evil continuously. And it repented the Lord when he looked down. So this is taking a Pike's Peak view of, of, uh, of uh, the scripture. And I, I, Pray that we can see this is the way we need to study the Bible. Uh, I'm going to go down here to, uh, let me just point out, you might remember Genesis 3.15. This is the first, called the Proto-Evangelium, and it's the first out-and-out -out prophecy, clear prophecy of the Messiah coming. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, 
This is the Lord speaking to the snake after sin had entered. And between thy seed and her seed, there's going to be a seed of the woman. And there's going to be a seed of mm -hmm. Satan. Of course, this culminates at the end. The seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. Yes. And the seed of Satan is the Antichrist. And it said, it shall bruise thy head. In other words, the seed of the woman is going to destroy the head of the serpent. Yes. Now, that's his dominion. His dominion is going to be taken away. He himself is going to go in the lake of fire. And thou shalt bruise his heel. And that's exactly what happened many times, but especially when Christ was on the cross. Yes. He was only bruised. Why? Because he rose again the third day. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. that prophecy right there, we're going to see play out here. Uh, we already have seen it. Uh, and also, we might take a look. Remember, there was two lines that we saw in Genesis uh, 4, 5, um, that uh, Bibles mistakenly had called the, the uh, righteous uh, line of Seth and the unrighteous line of Cain. Well, what this is is a play out of what God had, had uh, prophesied. And God was keeping track of it. Why? Because it is the line of Christ. And you notice how the Gospels begin? All but the Gospel of John begin showing what the line of Christ was. The genealogy of Jesus Christ. Verse 3. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man, for he is also flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. We talked about that last week. It was a prophecy, God speaking through Lamech, Noah's father, that there was going to be 120 years till the flood. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, that they bear children unto them, the same become mighty men, which were of old men of renown. You know, when I was uh, copying the scripture down of this, I had looked at the, at the news earlier that day. And they said, archaeologists had uh, dug up tools, ancient tools, uh, and they were surprised, they were confounded that these tools were so big, you know, that they'd be too big for men today to use. Well, that was written in the Bible, it told us, you know, in the beginning, that there were giants. They would need those big tools. And of course, there's other giants in the Bible as well. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of thoughts of his heart were only evil continuously. And uh, this was in part because they were, uh, you know, inhabited by sons of God, as they were called in the book of Genesis and in Job, or fallen angels. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now, I'd like to just point out here that God saw. That is called an anthropomorphism. And it repented the Lord, and it grieved him. That is called an anthropopathism. Now, what this means, anthropomorphism, is giving God human characteristics. For instance, when, when God wrote the Ten Commandments, the tables of the law, uh, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, the finger of the Lord did it, right? Well, that's an anthropomorphism. That is giving God, you know, men's interpretation. Why does the Bible do that? <laughs> so that we can understand it. Anthropopathism is giving God human emotions. God doesn't have to repent. God doesn't have to grieve. He knows what's going to happen, and he created everything in an anticipation. Yeah. You see, these are figures of thought that's used in the Bible. It's, it's like a type of metaphor that God uses 
so that we can understand what God's going through. Remember when we were um, uh, going through the minor prophets, especially the book of Hosea. God had the prophet Hosea uh, to marry a prostitute. Hosea knew when he married her that Gomer was going to leave. We're going to forsake him. Why did God have him do that? So we could understand. That's what right. What God's going through with the nation of Israel and so that Hosea could prophesy. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, so this is the same type of thing, only using instead of a type, that's using an anthropomorphism, assigning God human characteristics, and anthropopathism, assigning God human emotions. So that it's we, the close, closest interpretation that we can understand. That's human. right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and that's what we were reading, actually, in, in the book of Ephesians. We didn't go in the first chapter, but he's saying that he talked about God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and how he lifts us up into heavenly places. You see, uh, in the time that we're talking about here, in the time of Noah, uh, they couldn't have understood that at all, could they? Yes. Because uh, even at the time of Abraham, what did you know? God promised him a land, a seed, and uh, going to bless the world through him. Um, yeah. But in the New Testament... God can lift us up into uh, heavenly places. We can begin to understand that because we know the Old Testament. If we don't know the Old Testament, we probably won't understand that. Yes. And that shows the importance of Scripture and God, you know, in anticipation of what's going to happen. Um, uh, you Amen. know, does exactly that in Scripture. All right, let me come down here and we'll, uh, let's see, verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Remember this, repenteth. God doesn't need to repent. That's an anthropopathism. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I, you know, this is twisted and contorted itself but if we take a look at that verse it says noah found grace it doesn't say noah received grace it doesn't say god poured out his grace on noah however god did but what does it mean when somebody finds something that they were searching it that's right. That noah was looking for the grace of god and if we'll take a look all you have to do uh, in a computer Bible, is look up the word grace. And 99% of the time, that grace is going to show somebody that was looking for grace in somebody else's eye. Amen. Whether it's God or somebody else. There's a few times in the book of Psalm that grace is used for the same meaning as the grace of a figure skater on ice. There's two or three times in the Bible but I think grace is used 100, if I remember right, 178 times and 99% of the time. It is somebody looking for grace in somebody else's eyes. Grace Noah God. found grace. He was the only person on the earth that did find that because Noah was the only one looking for it. And look what it says in the last part of that verse. In his generation, he was perfect in his generations. Nobody else were. Everybody else was inhabited by demons, and their thoughts were only uh, evil continuously. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Amen. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth you know all flesh now that's another form of thought because that doesn't include noah and his family 
uh, that's called a, uh, uh, what is that called? Well, I can't think of it right now, and I don't want to take time to, hyperbole, that's what it is. It's like the whole town came out to see the president. Well, that doesn't mean they they uh, emptied out the hospitals and the old folks' home and everything, but it's just the most of the people, and that's what, what this is saying here. Verse 13, and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And this is why Noah is going to be the comforter, He's going to comfort them. Remember, Lamech had prophesied that. And he says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make of the ark, thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. We'll talk about this a little bit more next week. But uh, this word pitch here uh, is the same word uh, that is used as the mercy seat uh, when the, the tabernacle is, is being built, it's the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so Noah was to cover the Ark with atonement. We'll get back to that next week when we have a little bit more time. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the Ark shall be 300 cubits. How long is that? 450 feet. And the breadth is 50 cubits. What's that? That's 75 feet wide. And the height of it is 30 cubits, which is 45 feet high. Uh, I remember reading the Revelation record by Henry Morris. He was a hydrologist. And uh, he, he studied the size of, of boats that are cons considered to be unsinkable. And they have the same dimensions, I mean, percent-wise, same ratio of sides as the ark. It's because God gave, you know, the right dimensions to mm. Noah. That boat was not going to sink. Verse 16, and window shalt thou make in the ark, and the cubit shalt finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set aside thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. The three stories of the ark, of course, point to the Trinity. I think we can see that. Um, sure. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth and destroy all flesh. Again, that's a hyperbole. Wherein is the breadth of life? For under heaven and everything that is in it, the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. You see, God's going to make a covenant with Noah. And we'll see that next time as well. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy son's wife with thee. Now we need to remember what the Lord says here. We'll have to fully explain it next week. But the Lord didn't say go into the ark. The Lord's going to say come into the ark. Why do you think that is? because the Lord's already inside the ark. He's saying, come into the ark. The Lord was going to be in that ark too. It wasn't about to sink. Not only was it the right proportion in size, but the Lord was going to be there. And of every living thing, all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. And I should be male and female. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive, and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it unto thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. That them is a pronoun, and that refers to, of course, the animals, male and female. Again, this is all in, in anticipation of what the Lord's going to do. The Lord is going to start all over again with eight people. As a matter of fact, the three uh, uh, sons of Noah and their wives, everybody on earth today has descended from those three. Now, why did all this work? And God knew it was going to happen there. Why did would Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Because the Lord knew 
Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. You know, this is what God preaches in Romans 3 and 4, that we are justified by faith, that we are saved by his grace. We were looking for his grace. We come with humility. And the Lord's the only one that you know, will pronounce us righteous. But if we see that faith without works is dead, that's what it, it teaches in James 2, that the righteousness is vindicated when the works are there. Can we see that's what it meant in, in Ephesians chapter 2? Yeah. That's what it meant in Genesis chapter 6. That's what it means in Romans chapter 3 and James chapter 2. That's what it means all through the Bible. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And what does he want us to do? He wants us to walk with him. Amen. And how do we do that? Sharing his word. Thus yeah. did us, uh, according to all that God commanded us, so do we. Can we see Amen. that's how it happens? Just like it happened with Noah. The Lord said, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. I wasn't changing the words in that, but God is commanding us today, just like he commanded Noah. He wants us to walk with him. And that's how Noah did. Mm -hmm. And because Noah did, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. The Lord could give it right away because he has foreknowledge. He knew it was going to happen. Just like he created everything in the earth uh, in anticipation of what was going to happen. I thank you. I think this is an important part of it. We, The Lord told us to come into the ark. And so we got inside the ark today. But next week, we'll take a look at, uh, you know, what happens uh, to, uh, you know, the earth and to the people inside the ark.